Welcome to this first series of uh, videos and, and lectures about uh, EU and U.S. data protection law. Why is data collection and access to data so important? Well, in short, our economies depend on it around the world. The U.K. economy, for example, is heavily reliant on data flows, with cross-border data flows increasing 28 times from 2005 to 2015. Digitally intensive sectors such as telecommunications and financial activities account for 16% of UK output and 24% of total exports, so it's a big business. This map might be a little difficult to decipher from PowerPoint, but in general, as of 2018, the areas in red show countries where there is heavier regulation and enforcement of data. So what should organizations do to prepare for all of these different regulations and laws that continue to crop up around data collection and data processing? Well, organizations should ensure that the relevant decision makers understand the data protection regulations and that they're accounted for in any policies, procedures, or other relevant documents. Data protection language, for example, should be included in standard agreements and contracts and all internal policies and procedures that address data protection issues, particularly HR policies, IT policies, and any policies that might affect individual customers. Those should be reviewed to make sure they remain appropriate. Now the United States has about 20 sector-specific or medium-specific national privacy or data security laws and hundreds of such laws among its 50 states and its territories. California alone has more than 25 state privacy and data security laws. These laws which address particular issues or industries can be very diverse. In addition, the large range of companies regulated by the Federal Trade Commission are subject to enforcement if they engage in materially unfair or deceptive trade practices. The FTC has used this authority to pursue companies that fail to implement reasonable, minimal data security measures. They fail to live up to promises in privacy policies, or they frustrate consumer choices about processing or disclosure of personal data. The General Data Protection Regulation, which is also known as the GDPR, is a European Union law which entered into force in 2016 and following a two-year transition period became directly applicable, in, applicable law in all member states of the EU on the 25th of May in 2018 without requiring implementation by the EU member states through national law. In Europe, you'll find a lot more harmony in terms of regulations around data protection and privacy compared to the piecemeal patchwork approach by the United States. More than ever, it's crucial that organizations manage and safeguard personal information and address their risks and legal responsibilities in relation to processing personal data to address the growing thicket of applicable data protection legislation. In the United States, the definition of personal data varies widely by regulation. The Federal Trade Commission, or FTC, considers information that can be reasonably used to contact or distinguish a person, including IP addresses and device identifiers, as personal data. However, very few U.S. federal or state privacy laws define personal information as including information that on its own does not actually identify a person. Our definition of sensitive personal data also varies widely by sector and by type of statute. Generally, personal health data, financial data, credit worthiness data, student data, personal information collected online from children under 13, and information that can be used to carry out identity theft or fraud are considered sensitive. For example, U.S. state data security breach notice and state data security laws typically cover name plus government identification number, financial account, or payment credit card number, and in some states, 
health insurance, medical, and or biometric data, and username and password for an online account. The EU definition of personal data is this. It's any information relating to an identified or identifiable person. This is an intentionally very broad definition. It covers the usual areas like name, address, and bank or health records, but it goes further in many areas. For example, car registrations, photographs and satellite images, those are all classified as personal data. The GDPR is also staggeringly complex and could ensnare some U.S. companies in a foreign regulatory hell. One reason the GDPR is important is that it's become a business in its own right, providing for an army of consultants, lawyers, and public relations firms. The GDPR applies in Europe, of course, but it also affects foreign companies that do business there. U.S. firms have employees or customers in Europe. Anyone from the likes of Facebook to small app developers, they're affected by the GDPR. In the video published just before the GDPR came into effect, the narrator is going to tell us what specific areas to look for in order to be compliant or protect our own data and the issues with many current privacy policies, one being they are way too long. 120 yards, 360 feet, 4,320 inches, 35 privacy policies. Nearly 400 pages. Yes, see that right there? That's me. And see all of those? Those are the privacy policies of the apps, services, and operating systems I use on a fairly regular basis. Most have been revised recently to meet Europe's GDPR laws, going into effect May 25th. Hence those emails you've been getting. Oh yeah. They're all there. AccuWeather, Amazon, Apple. Verizon, Waze, Zillow. Sure, a lot of these have been rewritten, so you no longer need a law degree to understand what's going on. But still, no reasonable human being with a job or even basic life responsibilities is going to sit and read this much text. Now, I didn't just come out here to yell at companies to make these shorter. Stay down page 17 of Spotify, page 7 of Uber, page 40 of Microsoft. Okay, maybe I did. But I also came out here to tell you not to ignore these documents anymore. It's never been more important to understand how your data is being collected and used. So here are some tips for how to tackle them. <coughs> Number one, understand the outline. Read enough privacy policies and you'll quickly figure out the playbook. Part A, what data is collected? Part B, why the company needs that data and who else gets to see it? Part C, what controls, if any, are in place to limit abuse of that data? A tool called Polisys, built by data scientists at a number of different universities, lets you visualize these three buckets for a number of different services. You just type in the name. Number two, search for keywords. Even though policies may have similar formats, you should search the mass of text for specific keywords. Third parties. How is your data shared with outside developers and marketers? Retain or store. How is your data retained or stored by the company, and why? Delete. Can you delete your data? The new GDPR regulation requires this to be an option. Number three, opt out where you can. The final thing to search for, settings or opt out. This will help you find what you can get out of. For instance, I searched settings in the LinkedIn policy and enabled a bunch of new advertising controls the company has put in place to meet GDPR requirements. Ultimately, you'll probably read 30 to 40 yards of your privacy policies with these tips. And just by doing that, you'll understand more about where your data is going and what you can do about it. It's really our only line of defense until companies start to be clearer and more concise about our info. So you get the idea, and I'm sure some of you have actually looked at uh, a privacy policy or at least glanced at one before to see how massive these things can be. And you really have to ask yourself, is that what's best for the company and the consumer? 
So let's take a look very quickly at some uh, vocabulary here on different kinds of data because you heard her talk about third-party data in the video. Well, what are these different kinds of data? What does that mean? Well, let's start with first-party data. This is the information you own and you collect from your customer relationship management efforts. Your website, your customer feedback, a mobile app, in-store collection methods, contact center communications. One of the benefits associated with first-party data is that you can exercise complete control over how it's collected, how it's processed, stored, managed, and secured. So you can spot any quality issues. First-party data also seems to be a favorite among marketers. E-Consultancy surveyed 302 marketers working at the management level or higher and found 81% of respondents reported strong return on investment by using first-party data. When asked which advantages they acquired by utilizing first-party data, study participants noted its free of use, unregulated composition, and uniqueness. However, first-party data isn't without its limitations. The biggest limitation is reach. For example, your business may collect the purchase habits of all your customers and you can create audience segments based on this. But that might only represent a few thousand users. Plus, it is users you already know. While third-party data, for instance, could provide the purchase habits of millions of users that have never interacted with your brand. Second-party data is simply someone else's first-party data. You obtain this information through your business partnerships. Acquiring second-party data often requires some give and take. This reciprocal relationship is born of long-term relationships with other companies founded on trust and mutual objectives. For example, say Ford sold the list of their clients that recently bought the Ford F-150 to Costco. The data that Costco now possesses about Ford F-150 customers would be considered second-party data. Like first-party data, second-party data has its limitations. For one thing, you don't own the data and you can't guarantee the quality. Also, you have no control over a partner's data quality assurance processes. Therefore, there's no possible way to see how the business collected and processed the information. Also, according to Marketing Land, one of the biggest issues is privacy. So going back to the example, Ford might need to inform its audience that it's selling their information to Costco. Furthermore, just because someone bought a Ford F-150 doesn't mean they'll want to shop at Costco. Third-party data is essentially any data collected by an organization that has no direct relationship with you. For example, a third-party data provider such as Experian and LexisNexis will have relationships with multiple companies that sell them data. The provider will then make the data anonymous and group the data into different segments. Then you can purchase those different segments, such as in market to purchase a luxury car. By collecting data from various sources and putting it together, this gives third-party data incredible reach. But the problem with third-party data is that you have no visibility as to where it's coming from. You also have no idea when the data was collected and how up-to-date it actually is. For example, a third-party data provider could have bought a data set of in-market purchasers from Porsche in the last three months, and now some of those users are no longer in-market for a luxury car. But equally, a third-party provider could get data that's only a couple of days old. You just don't know. It's like a black box of data. Half of all Americans believe their personal information is less secure now than it was five years ago. And a sobering study from the Pew Research Center reveals how little faith the public has in organizations, whether government or private sector, to protect their data. And with good reason. In 2017, there was a disastrous breach at Equifax. Yahoo's admission that billions of its email accounts were compromised Deep Root Analytics' accidental leak of personal details of nearly 200 million U.S. voters and Uber's attempt to conceal a breach that affected 57 million accounts. Individuals are left stymied about what action they can take, if any, to protect their digital assets and identity. 
So companies should be very proactive in setting up preventative measures at the beginning. Disclosure after the fact only means that by the time a breach is disclosed, harm could already have befallen hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of individuals. That's why it's crucial for companies around the world to understand the laws and the consequences.